All right. Oh, well, thank you all so much for being here this evening. I know that it's a very uh, busy time of the semester, and so I really, um, it means a lot to me uh, you're taking your evening to take part in this event this, uh, tonight. Uh, well, I'll keep my opening remarks very brief so that we can get to the fabulous uh, panel of playwrights, actors, and directors we have with us. Um, so the premise for this roundtable event was to try to bring together a group of uh, writers, directors, uh, and actors who have used theater to reckon with war in different ways, uh, and to ask what theater making and watching allows us to think, to feel, to see, and to share about war today. Um, and to pose these questions, uh, bearing in mind the very uh, deep uh, historical relationship between the art form of theater and uh, the form of war as well. Uh, the earliest plays that we have from classical Greece were written and performed by military veterans, uh, dramatizing episodes from the Trojan War during a century when the newly democratic Athenian city-state was perpetually at war. Uh, Elizabethan drama emerged and rose to popularity with the most popular uh, genre being the history play, which dramatized the stories of the rulers and the wars that had shaped the nation, uh, and that drew audiences with thrilling and choreographed scenes of battle and copious violence. Uh, and more recently, at the end of the 20th century through the 21st century, a growing body of plays have grappled with changes in the structure and nature of warfare today, responding primarily to uh, the rise of information technology, bringing in asymmetry to American wars in the Middle East, uh, and also the erosion of many states' centralized control of organized violence, leaving space for wars between ethnic nationalist leaders, non-state actors, and warlords largely targeting civilian populations uh, in, for example, Bosnia, Kosovo, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, I had the opportunity this semester to teach a course on war plays from the Greeks to today. Uh, many of my uh, students are here. And one thing that we noticed uh, across historical periods was uh, three consistent uh, and very distinct ways in which theater has been seen to relate to war. Uh, that on the one hand, plays have been seen to instill martial virtues of honor, of bravery, of sacrifice, to inspire and to rally uh, troops and the population, uh, and to offer heroic models to emulate. On the other hand, uh, plays have been seen to parody these very virtues, to expose uh, militarism as uh, absurd, as manipulative, as based on uh, illusion and bad theater. Uh, and the third tradition, uh, sees theater as a way of healing war's psychic and moral injuries, of uh, bearing witness, sharing grief, communalizing trauma, and allowing a kind of reintegration uh, following a divisive conflict. So while theater has often been intimately connected to war and reflected on war in lots of ways, it's done this very differently uh, from uh, the ancient Greeks to today. Uh, so one of the things that I'm most thrilled about in the lineup that we have with us is that uh, these theater makers have both done very innovative work that engages with contemporary society's relationship to war uh, and uh, addressed issues with new technology, with media, with gender, with class, but also have looked backwards to earlier theatrical uh, texts that deal with war in their own uh, contexts and asked uh, what these traditions, what uh, this corpus of uh, older war plays can do for us today. Uh, so first, on the end, we have uh, Stefan Wolfert, who's an actor, writer, director, and teacher. He's the founding artistic director of Shakespeare and Veterans and the Veteran Center for the Performing Arts. Stephen is also the creator of Decruit, which is a program that uses classical actor training to reintegrate military veterans. Uh, and Stephen recently performed off-Broadway his one-man show, Cry Havoc, uh, which has since been on tour all over the place. He was performing it in Vermont last night and zoomed down here to talk to us tonight. Uh, and, and it, Stephen, tells the story of his service in the Army as an infantry, infantry officer and a medic, of coming home, of discovering Shakespeare, and of the role of performing arts in uh, working through trauma, making meaning of his experiences, and sharing them with others. So we're very happy to have Stephen with us today. Uh, next, we have the playwright George Brandt, 
who has also adapted Shakespearean material in his plays about war, uh, most recently in a play about a Rhode Island theater company that mounts uh, an all-women production of Henry IV and Henry V during World War II when all the male actors are away at war. Uh, the play is called Into the Breaches. It is a comedy. <laughs> Uh, George is best known, however, for his play Grounded, which was the first major American play to deal with drone warfare. Uh, the production in New York at the Public Theater received the Lucy Lucille Lortel Award for Outstanding Solo Show. It also won uh, the Edinburgh Fringe First Award and the Smith Prize for Political Theater. Uh, and in recent years, has had over 100 productions around the globe and is currently being adapted into a film and into an opera. Last, we're joined by playwright, actor, and director Judith Thompson. Uh, Judith has worked with Greek tragedy uh, in her uh, play Electra in Bosnia, which was commissioned by the Women in War Project and performed in Greece. Uh, in 2008, Judith's play Palace of the End, which features three monologues from real-life figures from the American wars uh, in Iraq, received the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize for Best English Language Play Written by a Woman. Uh, Judith is the first Canadian to win this award. Uh, among her numerous other awards, Judith is the two-time winner of the Governor General's Literary Award, and in 2006, she was invested as an officer in the Order of Canada. So we're going to uh, hear short personal narratives uh, from Stefan and George and Judith about their work. Uh, and please join me in welcoming them all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was in the army. Um, I was in. I entered in '86. I was in. I got out roughly in '93. Uh, but in uh, 1991, after the first Gulf War was over, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in training, uh, a friend of mine was killed in Fort Irwin, California. Um, it was in, wasn't the first time I'd seen anyone killed, but it was there was something about it. It was first of all, it was point blank. It was my best friend. It was training. Uh, it's what I understand now Jonathan Shea would describe as a moral injury uh, because it was training, this shouldn't have happened, you know, all these things that I had in my mind of what's morally correct. Um, and uh, I lost it, started traveling around on an Amtrak train. Uh, I was in Montana and saw Shakespeare's Richard III. I come from a working class family in Wisconsin. I had never been to, play uh, to a play before, much less a Shakespeare play. Um, in fact, I had an older brother who used to beat me up to make me a man and not do quote-unquote faggy things or be a homo or any of that kind of bullshit. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyways, um, that play had such a profound shift, uh, it caused such a profound shift in me that I left the Army, went to graduate school for, for acting, became a classical theater actor. I uh, went to Trinity Rep in Rhode Island. I don't know if anyone was familiar with it. But in, in any case, uh, um, from that, uh, I saw my entire being changing as I did classical actor training, and in particular working on Shakespeare. As you mentioned, the history plays were the ones that were most compelling to me. Um, and then about seven years ago, my wife, Dawn, is in the second row right there. Um, we were together, and after doing end-of-life care with her mother, um, and my back going out for a second time in my life and being bedridden, um, I finished Cry Havoc. It started as a graduate thesis. Uh, play and then became a solo show to answer the question of what the hell is wrong with me. Quite literally, that was the question I was trying to answer when I wrote it. And uh, I didn't sit down and write it like these two uh, over incredibly talented folks do. I more of, I do this, I made it up. I had 25 Shakespeare uh, monologues memorized. I knew how they worked in my brain, um, or rather, how they worked in my life, rather, um, and in my body. And I performed in front of a live audience and wrote the play as each night as I performed live. Then we would go home and arrange, rearrange the stories and the monologues and cut and trim. And Don's a brilliant director, so she'd say, no, do this, cut that, be more honest. What's that? What was that about? You started talking, you know, um, the craft of it uh, came in from other people um, to having me be more honest about it. And that work led to then our decru program where we are now actually teaching this to other veterans, none of whom want to be professional, well, I shouldn't say none, most of whom have no interest in being professional actors. It's an actual treatment program to treat trauma, being evaluated by 
our partners at NYU and CUNY, uh, Alicia Ali and Bruce Homer, her husband, uh, those two are actually scientifically evaluating it with EEGs, heart rate variability, and uh, psychological uh, disclosure surveys. Uh, and the results are after a mere 24 hours of doing classical actor training, narrative therapy, and Shakespeare, um, it's a different brain. Quite literally, we take a picture of the brain before and after 24 hours of doing Shakespeare and performing publicly, <clears throat> it's a different brain. And I'll leave it with this as I hand it off. We do have a participant of that program, uh, that, besides my wife, that showed up here tonight. I'm just going to say it that way, so it's up to that participant later when we have questions if they want to self-disclose that they participate in the program. But, um, but yeah, so that's, I, I think I'll leave it there so you can come back to me because uh, I'm really just, I'm filling in too for Maurice Ducal, who's a veteran and a brilliant playwright, and, and uh, so I want to make sure I leave enough, more than enough time for you, you folks. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm George, and uh, just a little bit of background before I get specific about it. Um, so that it's about a, a female fighter pilot who uh, gets unexpectedly pregnant and then uh, has to withdraw from the Air Force, and when she re-enlists, ends up assigned to drone duty instead. And the bulk of the play is her having to make that mental transition. Um, I'm telling some people here who have directed the play before, but <laughs> that synopsis is very familiar. Um, yes, so um, yeah, just to talk a little about the genesis of the play and about um, some of the inspirations for the character. Um, uh, I was, I came from a general interest in drones. Um, you know, we were being presented, uh, it was being presented to us as a program that, you know, was very specific, you know, targeted only the targets they wanted to get. And in addition, put none of our soldiers at risk. So it, it really did seem like this win-win situation. And um, I started thinking about the play in 2010. And back then, not many people were really thinking about um, uh, the ramifications of it. Or, or really, it was kind of more like, OK, well, that sounds good. And nobody really wanted to think about it too much, <laughs> about how the sausage got made there. Um, but I was curious about it, um, particularly when I read in an article that uh, uh, President Obama had used uh, drones three times as much in his first three months as Bush had in his for, in his total eight years. Um, so then I was like, oh, we're using these quite a bit more frequently, aren't we? And um, and then frankly, as somebody who had had put a lot of um, uh, blame on, on President uh, George W. Bush's door, uh, and now uh, here was somebody that I did vote for who was in fact escalating the program, I kind of felt um, as a citizen that I, I should learn more about it as well, um, as somebody who in some way kind of voted for it. Um, so uh, in learning more about it, I, I, I had trouble finding a writing angle into it until uh, finding a, reading about the pilots who, who flew these planes. Um, I had assumed they flew them from the countries that, that they were bombing, but it turned out that no, they can fly them from here in this country, which um, still, I don't, it still seems like science fiction to me, but um, <laughs> that 8,000 miles away, you know, we're controlling these things and there's only a one second delay. Um, and the fact that they were flown at one of the major Air Force bases is just outside of Las Vegas, and a lot of the pilots live in Vegas. Um, also, uh, was that that would almost seem too on the nose from a writing point of view? I was like, okay, so you're in Las Vegas, where everything is unreal, and there's a fake Paris, and there's a fake pyramid, and and then there's this program that seems very unreal as well, um, in which you almost have to imagine um, what you're doing. And then the fact that these pilots drive um, through the desert to get to this other desert um, also seems, you know, very provocative to me. Um, uh, I learned a lot, uh, yeah, the research was kind of tough um, for the play because it was uh, a technically a top secret program. I think it still is technically, but um, yeah, it's a bit out of the bag at this point. Um, but uh, one of the things that was most helpful was the, the Stars and Stripes online magazine, which um, is kind of an in-house, you know, military um, magazine, w was very frank about um, some of the struggles the pilots were going through of these of these drones, and that in fact they were suffering uh, PTSD at the same rates as uh, pilots who were flying conventional planes. So that really struck me as interesting and something that I wanted to explore 
Um, and a lot of that came from the fact that, the, that this was kind of a new way of fighting, you know, this new machine, and also this new way that uh, these pilots don't stay, there are no barracks at these bases that they go home at night, so they'll have a 12-hour shift and then go home. Um, it was really interesting to me, the fact that you might, you know, potentially kill somebody, you know, during the day, and then come home and be expected to be a productive member of your family. Um, uh, seemed very bizarre to me, and, and, and the level to which one can compartmentalize one's life uh, was really intriguing. Um, and then as far as characters, as I started, um, I, I decided that I, that I uh, felt like it was the strongest choice to make that protagonist a female, so I was looking to female um, fighter pilots for inspiration, and, um, and there are more and more these days, which is... is development. Um, but uh, a couple that really uh, I found interesting, that, um, there was a Major Stephanie Kelson who uh, was in a New York Times article you can find, um, Lessons from a Pregnant Fighter Pilot. And um, she, when she got pregnant, um, went to a, like a professional portrait photographer to have her picture taken. She wanted to commemorate it. And there's this gorgeous picture of her um, you know, fully pregnant um, in her flight suit with the helmet under her arm. Um, and it was just, it's just this amazing photo with, with, you know, motherhood and warrior and all these things rolled into one uh, that I found very provocative and which, for those who have read it, uh, figures very heavily in the play, as it turns out. Um, and then uh, Major Jackie Parker, who was um, the first woman uh, to fly um, in Air Force National Guard um, when they uh, allowed women to enter into Air Force combat. Um, and she, yeah, she was just kind of the general badass, and um, uh, one of her quotes that I found most interesting was, was she was almost uh, saying that being a pilot was its own gender, um, and that she's not trying to be a guy by doing this. She's just trying to be a pilot, and I am an Air Force pilot. Um, so that I found really interesting and um, definitely uh, influenced the character. Um, so I think, uh, Steph, and I will cut myself off there and hand it over. Uh, that's totally up to you. We can write to this and everything. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think coming up as a second wave feminist, I've always believed the personal is political, and in fact it is, because I think conflict is conflict, and whether it's personal or global, uh, conflict is conflict. And so I never thought to write a blatantly political play until I was thrown that challenge by a, a sort of cabaret that happens. Um, once every few months uh, in Toronto, and they said, write a very political play, pull it from the headlines, you have a week, a week, then there's a week's rehearsal. <coughs> I was haunted at the time by Lindy England. Uh, who was she? Was she being vilified? Uh, was she evil? Was she a tool of the Pentagon? What happened? And so I went down the rabbit hole of the internet and found such vile, crude things that even I couldn't make them up. They were, and I realized they were not in response to what Lindy England had done at all. They were in response to her being a woman and a woman who was not considered to be attractive. Um, it's too crude to even read to you that section, but I actually quote it verbatim uh, in the play. And so I wanted to know who this is. Is she culpable? She's in prison, eight months pregnant, um, and is she a victim of, of, of her society, of being a woman of absolutely zero privilege, uh, the life she grew up in West Virginia? and then being uh, in Abu Ghraib in that situation. So I'll just read you a little of her because I think that's the best way to describe it. So the play began with her, it was just a, a one uh, monologue and then it increased to three. So if you remember that famous picture of her with her thumbs up and a pyramid of naked Iraqi detainees um, often with the hoods over their head and she has her thumbs up and that was the picture that went all over, all over the media. Now look at her, that homely little private with the thumbs up and the naked Iraqi man. And, well, it's like a dream they're telling me I had, but I don't remember it like that. And they're saying, no, this is the dream you had. Because they can doctor pictures, you know. They can do anything they please. And those forces that do not want girls in the army wanted the world to see them pictures. Okay, okay, I'm going to be honest with you in the fact of it. That is what I did for one second. They said, give me the thumbs up, baby. So that's what I did. For one second of a whole year, dudes. And that is what everyone sees. 
How would you like your weirdest second life played out over and over, all over the world for all time? I'll tell you what most people don't know. Got a hell of a lot worse than that. That is for pussies. So what? They were naked. So? They get naked every time they have a shower. So? And as far as me laughing and pointing at the guy's willy, well, tie me down if that's the worst thing that happened to them at Abu Ghraib. They'd be loving it. That is not the style of girl I am, okay? I respect men in their privates, and I do not, nor have I ever laughed at a man's willy. But they are not men. They are terrorists. And I am very proud to say that the naked human pyramids was all my idea. <laughs> Actually, it's the first thing that came to my mind when I walked into that prison and seen all them men that look exactly alike. I know what might be fun. A human pyramid with naked captive terrorists. Because I always did have an interest in choreography. You know? And they might not have liked it, but they have learned something useful if they teach gym in a school or supervise a cheerleading squad. We was not entertaining ourselves. We was breaking down the terrorists. Taking the guy around on the leash? Well, he called me a dog. Yes, he did. Just like all you losers on the net, like all those assholes back in Fort Ashby. He knew a little English and he called me a dog, so for once in my life I could fucking give it to him. You think I'm a dog? You think I'm a fucking dog, you monkey? Let's go for a fucking walk. You want to go for a walk? And Charlie and them was laughing. Well, I never got laughs before because I'm not a funny person. And wow, man, get laughs is such a high. The guys was laughing, they loved it, so they go, put him on a leash. And I do like a sketch, like Saturday Night Live, like, oh my God, it's time to take the dog for a walk. Hey, Mom, did you take the dog for a walk? Did you take the dog for a walk? Nobody walked the damn dog. I'm walking it. Here, dog, you dirty dog. No treat for you today. You're a bad dog. And I'm pulling him. And I was surprised how different is a human net from a dog net. With dogs, you can pull and pull, and they just keep on going, but not with humans. They never saw. That's Lindy. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very tough, and it gets a lot nastier than that. And there's no doubt in my mind that she was a tool. She was used by the men. She was used by the Pentagon. Those were actually the orders. And, of course, things were a lot worse than, than that. And so then I'll just read the last one. So then I thought... Well, this monologue went to the Traverse and, and did very well. I thought, I need a whole play. I need to understand more. I don't understand enough. So I did a lot of research on David Kelly, who was the uh, microbiologist who was the major weapons inspector for um, England. And uh, he was found dead in the woods of Harrowdown Hill after speaking to the BBC um, the truth, that all the scientists knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction at all in Iraq. And he had been there 35 times and inspected, and then he, he was um, investigated, and there were these public hearings. He was a very shy man. Uh, it felt very much like persecution when he simply told the truth. And uh, he said, I think I'll be found dead, and in fact, he was. And it was ruled a suicide by the Hutton inquiry, uh, but many people, many people believe that uh, he was murdered. So I won't do him, because we don't have time. So the final one is that I have to know something about Iraqi women. And luckily, my neighbors in Toronto are Iraqi. He's a professor of Turkish history in New York. And Samara agreed to speak to me. And so we spent a lot of time together. And she just told me everything that she knew. And she um, translated uh, an account in Arabic about a woman named Nerdis al-Safar, who was, she and her husband were heads of the Communist Party in Iraq um, up and through the first Gulf War. And that was the only plausible opposition to Saddam Hussein. And there's no doubt that Saddam Hussein was a tyrant and a monster. Samara's brother was uh, buried alive by, by Saddam Hussein's uh, secret service. And, uh, and of course, they, they were happy to see him depose, but then they wished the Americans would have just gone, just left. And so she told me this about this. She, she translated this account from the Arabic, and I went home and wrote at Nerjas. And so I'll just read you a quick bit of her. One of my earliest memories is drawing in my own blood. Drawing a flower, a daffodil, for the school nurse. Looking back, I can't imagine why they were taking the blood of a child at school. I drew a daffodil because that is my name, a nerjas, a daffodil <coughs> in Arabic. My Western friends tell me there is no such name in English, 
although there are many of flower names. Uh, there is a rose, there is dahlia, there is lily, there is violet, and there is viola. What is fascinating to me is that women are the names of flowers, but not all flowers, because if you are English and you are named daffodil, people will laugh. That is what my friends have told me. And if they want to insult a man, say to a man that he is not masculine, they call him a pansy, but not rose or tulip. And another thing I have observed is that a woman is never called after a tree, only a flower, because the purpose of a flower is to attract a bee. And the tree, the tree stands alone, blissfully alone. The tree provides air and shelter and food. So I think all mothers should be given a second name after a tree. Now we skip to instruments of yearning, which is what Saddam's Secret Service was called, uh, came into her home to her. Well, one day, as I knew they would, they came for us. Thank God they let my mother take Leila, but they took Nahadni from school and me from my home. I had been boiling an egg to have with a date, it's true, and in came the thugs. Now the castle, so we are driving up to the castle. Now the castle has three stories. The highest floor is where they would make, take you to talk. The surroundings were quite nice, a reasonable conversation. If you were willing to talk, then you talked. You betrayed everyone you knew, and then you were free to go. Sadly, many were so afraid of torture, they talked immediately. I don't judge anyone. Everyone is different, and torture changes everything. Then, if you didn't wish to talk, they would send you down to the main floor. It was what we called torture light. Beatings, broken bones, nails removed, that kind of thing. And if you still didn't talk, you were sent to the basement. There were bodies everywhere. Bodies of people you knew. Once you have smelled the smell of death and suffering, nothing smells sweet again, not ever again. The memory, no, not the memory. The actual smell remains always somewhere in every breath you take. So, at first we were sent to the highest floor and we refused, of course, to speak. After an hour or so, we were sent to the first floor, a small room. Me, my 15 years old son, Nahadne, and my torturers. The first thing they did, they held my belly in their hands. <coughs> They laughed, and they said, who did this to you? I turned to my son. I said, do not listen to them. They are half men. And then I said, it is the child of my husband. And they asked to me, where is your husband? I said that I did not know. They started only by jumping on my feet and hitting my son's nose with a hammer. They hit him until he could not feel it, so he stopped crying out. We were inside hell now. I only prayed I would not lose the baby. My son and I looked at each other. I knew he would be strong. This went on for hours. Needless to say, I was raped many times in front of my son. They forced him to watch, but he did not see. His eyes looked into my eyes only. So wise for 15. And I guess just quickly about Nerjas, that's um, Samara, after she told me that story, and I said, I'd like to credit you in the, in the published book, she said, I don't want anything to do with that story, I wish I hadn't told you, it's, it's, nobody should know that. So I was very worried, but then once I had large Iraqi audiences, they very much wanted the story to be told. They were very glad it was told, so I kept it in because it's unbearable. And, and people, this, that goes further, her eight-year-old son is captured and he is actually tortured to death. And because she wouldn't reveal the name of her, or the whereabouts of her husband, who was captured anyway, that's the horrible irony is that she was sure they wouldn't actually kill a child, yet they were still after hearts and minds. Uh, and that's what she considers her, her sin, her great sin, which is why she tells the monologue, because it's an impossible 
situation. She said, if you, you can't understand. If I give up my husband, it's giving up a million children. But you, you, in your situation, how would you even know what that is, what that means? And so that's, that's what really, that's the heart of that monologue, that impossible, impossible decision. But people would leave, and, I, and my feeling is, she had to go through it, and all you had to do was listen to it. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you all so much thanks for those remarks and for that reading, Judith. I, I've read the play many times, and uh, hearing it in your voice just really brings out um, new depths in it for me. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I have many questions, uh, but I'm also conscious of wanting to leave ample time to hear uh, all of the thoughts and questions I'm sure percolating out here, too. Uh, so I'm going to um, pose some of mine. We'll moderate a short conversation for opening up it up to hear from uh, uh, everybody else. Um, my first question I'm going to uh, leave at a fairly uh, broad level, that is that I'm curious uh, for all of you um, what your experiences were in uh, uh, navigating between military and civilian realms in working on these projects. Uh, that, uh, Stefan, you've talked about working primarily with vets, but uh, in your programming and in uh, your shows, your different audiences, trying to engage civilians as well in conversations um, and, and uh, expose them to um, uh, things and to uh, people they might not normally meet. Uh, George, you sort of talked about working the opposite direction of not really knowing very much about military affairs uh, and then hearing this uh, news about drones uh, and then uh, reading, um, what was it, the Stars and Stripes magazine uh, and doing research and kind of working from the outside. Judith, you also talked about sort of uh, starting outside of the material you were writing about when you were interested in Lindy uh, England on the news. Uh, so we just love to hear from, from any or all of you. Uh, if you noticed uh, barriers uh, between military and civilian realms, uh, either for yourself and for making the work, uh, for the audiences you shared it with, um, and if so, uh, how, um, how you navigated those, how they were overcome. Uh, um, well, if I'll, I'll speak on what I what I think I understand the question to be. Um, so, correct, wrangle me in if I'm off. But um, I, the reason I'm going first, I think it might help uh, segue into what what you both have written. I'm coming at it as a veteran, and when we first started, when, when my wife and I started the Veteran Center for the Performing Arts in Los Angeles, one of the biggest obstacles we had was. Um, was for civilians to understand what the military experience was. Like, what is the gap? We hear this gap even before these wars began. We knew there was a gap. And uh, first, the gap was much, no, I shouldn't say much larger. There was a different gap before these wars began. And what that gap was for us was understanding that we were talking about military veterans and not veterinarians. And I'm not joking, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I would say vets, and people thought I meant veterinarians. Why would, why would veterinarians need Shakespeare? Um, and, and, uh, uh, I, I know it's funny now, but it, it makes my blood boil. Uh, but um, So one of the first things that we did early on was we interviewed, uh, I put a lot of my stories in there. I didn't yet have, I don't know, the whatever was needed for me to stand in front of people and share my stories. So I wrote a character that was uh, given a different name um, and that's what helped me so much, um, for one thing. And then we wrote other uh, characters. There was a, one of the, the people that wrote, um, that Dawn portrayed, was a female, uh, um, female officer in the Air Force. We represented all five branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and different uh, genders, if I can put it that way, because you know, honoring gender fluidity as well in the military as well as out. Um, and the first play we had was quite literally that, was each a member of each branch express, uh, expressing, or sharing rather, their true story, but handed over to professional actors. And then we had a drill sergeant who segued those two. That was our narrator. We chose a drill sergeant because not only is that something a, a civilian will at least identify, uh, but that's the one, one of the main unifying factors for all five branches as well. Whereas I might not speak naval language if they refer to a fleet I kind of comprehend what that is, but even though we're in the military, I don't really get it. But a drill sergeant, that we get. We all know that, that unifying factor, and civilians do. So we began there, and we realized how far we had to go 
before we could even begin having other conversations like PTS and, and what is the problem that, that we have when we get out. It was what the hell happens in the military? What is basic training? How many branches are there? How many people are in the Marines? Why is it called the Corps? Like all these questions, we had to answer that first. So once we got that, then I could start unpacking my own stuff. And by doing that, I was. My own stuff was coming into it. So my gap was slightly different. It was approaching it and, and, and not dumbing down for civilians what my experience and my brothers and sisters' experiences were. Because I wasn't seeing it in Hollywood. You, you referred to some of the, or you did, some of the, the movies and whatnot. When I joined the Army, um, Top Gun was out. So the Navy was really amazing. But guess what was out for the Army? Private Benjamin and Stripes. So the army was absolutely shat upon. I and mean, if you had a pulse, you could get in the army. And thank goodness that's what the requirements were so I could get in. Because I had been paralyzed in high school and medically they didn't want me, but they were so desperate. So that's what we had to contend with. Um, and, and then you're getting, fi you know, finally, what a horrible thing to say. When these two wars, these two invasions happened, when we chose to go into areas that no one's ever held that land, ever before, but we decided we could, um, then we started elevating the conversation on a little more, uh, on a level to where um, it became second nature for people to hear vets, um, to hear the term, thank you for your service. Now vets hate it. When I got out, it was never spoken. It was never said. The Vietnam veterans were never thanked for their service or welcomed home. So, so that's where my whole thing came in, was trying to get civilians to understand my theatrical experience. Same thing in grad school, right? When we covered Shakespeare, and they would do the St. Crispian's Day speech, you know, it was like this, hurrah, huzzah, and all this other happy, you know, professional, yes, let's go to war bullshit, and the experiences that I had in the military, we never felt that way when the cards were that far down. When we thought we were gonna die, no one was going like, yes! And those of us who make it, we'll get sure it's going to No, that wasn't true. That wasn't happening, you know what I mean? So that was my angle on it. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah, just a couple things. I, yeah, as I said, like the research, uh, in looking into things, um, I remember the only time I could actually, the best picture I had of, of inside one of the trailers that they pilot these drones from was actually from a children's book, which was totally bizarre. It was kind of like a war for youth picture book or something <laughs> bizarre like that. And and it was kind of one of those, like, as you say, kind of like, we're making the nation safe. And gee, isn't this great? Look at our technology. It was a very gung-ho uh, book about drones that, you know, was 20 color photograph pages long. Um, so yeah, so strangely enough, that was the best I had um, to go with there. And I kind of, I, I don't know, because I, I was having trouble finding out exactly what was going on. It actually gave me some dramatic license as far as the training section of the play. I was like, well, all right, if they're not gonna tell me what it is, I guess I'll just kind of make it up. Um, and uh, felt, yeah, um, a little better about that. Um, as, the, as the play got workshopped and such, um, I had a playwright friend, Matt Smart, who um, he recommended uh, a lieutenant colonel um, in the Air Force to read the play. Um, if I wanted, um, and give me feedback. <laughs> um, so I took a deep breath and, and got in touch with this guy. <laughs> and uh, this was after about a year of working on it on my own. Um, so I really sweated that one out, you know, waiting for, come on, um, maybe I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> no. Um, uh, <laughs> so I uh, was, yeah, sweating it out for him to call. He was also named George, so that gave me some solace. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and he was a really generous guy, like, he called and we talked for like an hour, and, and he had read it so closely, and he had, he had done theater in high school, so he, he he's like, well, I just, yeah, I stage manager back in high school, so he would kind of keep telling about it, his high school experience, and, and he, I think, felt that he, you know, he had a foot in the theater as a result, so he was kind of like, well, I know you're not going to change that, but actually it's kind of this. So there were some things that, that he felt that, um, uh, he's like, well, actually, you know, the camera would be more toward the nose of the plane, but I think I see why you're putting it more on the belly, so you're probably not gonna change that. So he wouldn't, he wasn't dictating changes to me. Um, there were some things that obviously he was kind of more uh, firm about um, and felt like, well, that's really not what they call that, or that's, you know. Um, so he was a great help. Um, 
And yeah, and since it's been really kind of strange because the, because the the play I, I discovered like a year ago was getting assigned at the Air Force at this point, which is really weird because it was not I don't know that that's just weird. And then um, and then <laughs> and then uh, somebody contacted me and asked if I would Skype into a couple of the classes. Um, and talk, and so that was really interesting. One interesting thing about that was that uh, in the general theater class, there was a mix of women and men, um, but in the women and war English class, there were only women. So, you know, do that as you may. But, um, but I thought that was kind of interesting. But yeah, and it's fast, you know, <laughs> I would say nobody's all that fond of the end. Um, in the Air Force, neither the lieutenant colonel I spoke with or uh, or the classes I skyped into. Um, but other than that, um, uh, it seems that um, uh, yeah, it's been it's been I mean maybe well received is a weird way to put it, but uh, but I don't know. It, it seems like people uh, drone pilots kind of feel like their story is being told through it, which which is great. Um, and 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 some have have come and seen it, and um, and, and some. I mean, some uh, Air Force people have left their helmets behind. Like, I mean, it's, it's there was one production that was in upstate New York, and, and um, uh, somebody from the Air Force came, and they came back the next night, and like, you need this, and gave his helmet to this woman, and she was allowed to keep it for the rest of the run. And so, so there's been some extraordinary uh, crossover between um, my very civilian <laughs> experience and, and the military one. Thanks for me. Um, aside from a massive amount of research, of course, interviews and, and articles and on and on, um, I have a cousin who's a medic uh, in the Canadian Forces, and she a, and a good friend who's a lieutenant colonel in, in the forces, and they both broke barrier after barrier after barrier and faced extraordinary levels of harassment. Uh, just an example, Susan, who became the lieutenant colonel, would walk into a flying class and every man left. And the, the instructor said, I'm not teaching a woman. That's all there is to it. And of course, she aced the class and was the best of the class. And, uh, happy stories. But they had to uh, construct a sort of a, an armor as people. So they, they projected a very powerful uh, image, both of them. And, and it was hard to see who was under that, but they had to. And, and Kate, also, who married my cousin, who married a woman, uh, encountered uh, extraordinary uh, prejudice, and her three sons did from her first marriage as well. Up in, um, there were, so she, she broke a lot of barriers, and just talking to her as much as I could, and then combining that with the research and my, and, and empathy, trying to channel, trying to, you know, to, to not be sentimental about, say, Lindy England, but to find, is there a crevice? Is there a crevice somewhere? And that's, that's what I was looking for. Uh, I want to ask next about uh, denial and numbness. I think that a common feature in all of your plays is that you ask audiences to look at things and to dwell with things that um, many civilian audience members habitually have learned to look away from. Uh, or become inured to, uh, or that, that are aware of in some level, um, but that, uh, or that as a um, survival mechanism in, mod in modern life, you kind of put blinders up to. Um, and so I, I'd be curious to hear, um, in uh, making spaces for audiences to uh, reflect on, to dwell with, to uh, engage uh, with, um, w w with this material, uh, what, what kind of engagement is it that you most uh, want to um, achieve? Uh, what seem to be the key ways of, of getting it? Uh, and how do you uh, create a space in which um, people can dwell with things that they normally avoid? Yeah. You want to reverse order? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I like to implicate myself first, must implicate myself first and thereby the audience is implicated. Because as you say, we elect people, we pay taxes, we participate, and uh, you know, we have to see what, what we have brought and can't look away from. And then I believe theater can change the world at its root, so it's very, very slow. But it's deeper, 
I think. And I think it's all about, there's a wonderful title of a, a play, When We Dead Awaken, who wrote that? That's just a great title. Because I think that's what theater is all about, when we, and I'm the dad, and I awaken, and the actors awaken, and the, the production team, and the audience, one hopes. And uh, it's, it's also that line seen through a glass darkly, somewhere in the, the, I'm not religious, but it is somewhere in the Bible, and it's a beautiful phrase, which I think is until we go to the theater, and then it's clean, I hope. So it's once we see, then what do we do? Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the things I wanted to play around with with, with um, the audience experiencing uh, what the pilot was 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 reading about how 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 boring basically it is to sit in a trailer for twelve hours um, and and kind of st and stare at this screen or bank of screens um, and so so playing with boredom was I mean it was kind of a new challenge to like consciously kind of want the audience to be a little bored in some sections of the play um, and try to figure out what, what, what is the limit to which people will tolerate being bored. <laughs> um, and that, that was a new one for me because I'm definitely usually you know, trying to avoid that at all costs. Um, and, and the repetition and, uh, of, the, of, of the day um, that uh, these pilots experience. Um, was something also that I was consciously playing with that I knew, uh, you know, it was another day where nothing happened, you know, um, and and over and over and over and 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 being aware of that and wanting to express that again without totally losing um, the audience, but trying to, but kind of pushing up against the brink of when that might happen. Um, my. Mine is, well, you mentioned at the, at, at, in your opening uh, remarks about the functions of theater. And my, mine would be the third, theater as medicine. Um, and, and almost, I wouldn't say exclusively, but that's the thing I'm most passionate about. And then my show, the show that I'm currently doing, we have three more that we're working on, and we had three before this one, but Cry Havoc is, <laughs> it's, I'm laughing because it's theater as medicine, but it, it kind of is a formula for failure. And if you look at it on the surface, because it's a solo show by yet another white guy using Shakespeare, talking about the theater as medicine, and using veterans' stories. So it's like, what, what things would turn Americans off the most? Let me put them all together into a single production. Um, but, uh, but as, as, as therapy, I'm standing in front of an audience and I'm saying, I'm not okay. Um, it's just, it, I, I'm not. I'm not pretending that, oh, I had a rough patch, but now I'm okay. And let me tell you about my rough patch. It's, I'm in the midst of a rough patch. I'm not sure I'll live till tomorrow. Here I am. Let's talk about why I think right now that I'm at this place. And um, I'm using the bare bones of theater. It's, it's uh it's me and the audience and a story, and that's it. I'm barefoot, I'm wearing yoga pants and a yoga shirt, and that's it. It's just me and you. No set, no lights, no costume. And you could argue that it's a costume, but it's really, I mean, of course, and there are lights, and there are, there's always a set, but I mean, I've done it everywhere from a room like this to large amphitheaters outside to in Hawaii, I did it on a set. Um, that the children had made for the Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> and they were about to tear it down. They said, don't you dare. You must leave that up. Because what would it be like? That's what I love about theater, right? What would it be like to do this show on that set? And it was challenging for a number of reasons. But, that, but now we, everything that we think we know, all the assumptions we think we have, let's challenge them right here in this space. And then the final thing I'll say about it is that what I learned uh, beside Besides openly embracing theater as medicine, the other thing I learned from the Native American community that I've worked with since the 2000s, specifically Randy <coughs> Reinhold in Los Angeles with Native Voices, and Yvette Nolan with Native Earth up in, in Alaska, um, um, Canada, rather. Um, your I, know, your homeland. Yeah. I was just in Alaska, which yeah. I'm thinking about as well, uh, and Princess up there, but um, is that after the shows, they would do uh, talkbacks. And now they get a bad name, sometimes for a good reason, but their talkbacks are, um, in a community conversation of now we have this problem and while it is workshopping the play for that community if you think about the massive amount of trauma inflicted um, onto that community they're using that play 
as Randy describes it, rather than think about it in my car alone on the way home, let's talk about it openly in the container with which the, the jar was opened. So let's stay in the container and talk about it fairly openly. So they do do play development, but it's more uh, more witnessing and more sharing of trauma stories, if you can put it like that, in that container. So that's what, um, that's the way I'm using it, if I even answer the question. Great, thank you. Uh, I have many more questions, but we've reached the time when I've committed to uh, turning it down to the Q&A portion. Uh, so we would love to hear uh, any questions, thoughts, responses for Stefan, for George, for Judith, for all of the above. Or I can keep going. <laughs> Uh, yes, in the very back. Hi, um, I have a question for Judith, and I'm wondering about how you approach structure um, in talking about uh, talking about war and experience of war from different perspectives, from the perpetrator and victim. I um, each character. I, I try to speak for. I do lots of research and then try to speak from inside out. Mm. And as far as the structure of the story. I'm a teacher as well, and I always begin my classes with every student telling a personal story of some kind of transformation, small or large, but something that changed who they are. And the structure is always perfect. I think when it's a real story, an authentic story, that we have an innate sense of structuring, and it can wildly vary, but it is perfect. And so I try to trust my intuition that way, and, and these stories are so haunting. And of course I revise and I edit. To, to make it more streamlined and put that part back here a bit when I've gone off my intuition. But, but largely, that's the way. I, after, after I spent um, one of the, when she translated from the Arabic, that terrible story, a true story, I just went home and wrote for four hours. I didn't look at any notes and just trusted that it would come out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sheena? Hi, uh, I'm in a work class. Um, and so my question is, um, specifically for George from Grounded, but I also want to hear what everyone else has to say about this. So we go from um, Greek combat, which is you know person on person, and Greek society is structured in a way where everyone can make sense of violence and warfare, to um, mass warfare, where you know it's machine guns, no one knows what they're doing, and then finally we go to drones, which is you know has both, which is mass warfare, but also um, when, and we see it grounded, we get to see the destruction that we make from Las Vegas. And so, um, do you think that as a society now, there's just a big gap where we don't know how to reckon with violence, where we no longer have that ethical Greek structure, and we're kind of being thrown in the wild as we tend to grapple with what it means to go to war, what it means to accept war? Yeah. Um... Yeah, that, what you're talking about, uh, maybe you know the uh, I'm Killing, the book. Um, John, uh, yeah. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Grossman. Okay, okay, yes, yeah, which is really, I mean, which kind of uh, details what you're speaking of, where um, uh, basically the hardest, uh, it's hardest to get someone to kill someone in hand-to-hand -in -hand mm -hmm. combat was, is basically one of the things that it boils down to. Um, and then once you remove that, um, actual physical, it's, it's easier with a knife, you know, it's easier with a gun, you know, it keeps getting easier. Um, and one of the things that yeah, fascinated me about drones, which you alluded to, which is in the play, is it, well, just this idea that even though, like, we've gotten as far away as we can, but at the same time, it, it's actually incredibly intimate um, that these pilots watch these people their targets for days, weeks, months. <laughs> um, they watch them uh, go about their family business. Um, you know, a lot of business is taken care of on the uh, the, the roofs of the houses because it's so hot. So you know, they'll watch them. You know, signs have sex on you know the roof, and um, so so they become really intimate with these people, who then sometimes they are then called upon to kill at the end of um, their months of uh, basically surveilling them. Um, and so, so it's a strangely intimate process, even though you're 8,000 miles away. So I, I don't know. To me, that seems like one of the disconnects that, that might be causing some of this, um, you know, mental, uh, mental uh, gymnastics that one has to do, what one has to enact in order to do this uh, particular job. Um, 
is that you are, it shouldn't, it shouldn't make a difference to you what you're doing, but it does. Um, and it really is, I mean, you know, if you watch these, you know, pretty hard to watch videos um, of, of these strikes, I mean, you really do, you, you get the picture. You know, when you see somebody blow up, you, um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to watch. Um, so yeah, so I think I think there is a, there is, uh, and it's and it's often one person, you know. Um, so it's, it's less an idea of of a, of a random machine gun, or it's actually somebody who you feel like you might know after months of, of looking at them and staring at them for twelve hours a day. Um, so I think there is there is a strange paradox there at work. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think one of the things I wanted to push back with is, is oftentimes it's like, oh, it's like a video game. It's like a video game. It's like, well, it's not really like a video game. <laughs> so that's even just a bald <laughs> line of the play, um, just because I wanted to get that off the table. Um, because it, 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 you know, a video game has no consequences, and 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 I think you know, the people piloting these planes know the consequences. They're not um, playing the game. So yeah, I bet that hopefully comes close to answering your question. Um, can I throw one thing on that? The um, the the uh, the disconnect that we're lucky enough to be working with scientists concurrently with our theater. So that's a really massive gift, and we've worked really hard to make it happen. But I'm so happy that we get to do it with some of the leading trauma psychiatrists and psychologists in the world, and what. Our contention is, I say ours and the colleagues that we're working with, like Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score, um, and, and, and a number of others, is that the disconnect that you're talking about is our stigmatization of trauma. Um, and that, that um, whether, that if we stigmatize the trauma, and by trauma, uh, let me give my personal definition, meaning any significant event that affects the way we interact with the world or other people, right? So it's if it's if it's significant event, whether it's a sustained event or a single incident, and, and that's the thing that we're fighting against. Most of people tend to think of it like, oh, that incident gave him PTSD. It's not. It's it's a framework of wiring. It's neural pathways that are formed. Um, it may have been formed probably and most likely as as children, um, and then make us more susceptible. But um, it's not weakness, by the way. Let me say that. But what you so brilliantly cover. Uh, in, in, in that is with the drone strike, the, the military was asking, well, why are they having, in fact, your PTS rates among the drone pilots started exceeding combat veterans, uh, the infantry? And we were writing them saying, we know why, we know why. Because there wasn't a communalization of the traumas, Jonathan Shea, which you assign as well, uh, talks about in his book, Achilles in Vietnam, um, and which is the communalization is theater. So it wasn't people coming together saying, hey, this happened, it's affecting me to put it very broadly and generically, but that container to have that, to discuss what's going on and that it's after effects, isn't taking place. Um, and with the drone pilots in particular, because they would spend the 12 to 24 hours in the cubicle, then go home and couldn't talk about it. Um, right. But the infantry units, the reason it was exceeding is the infantry units, we go through an experience and at least afterwards we can secretly go, God, that was kind of... Up, right? So you can at least talk a little bit, even if it's in private. There's still some level of camaraderie, if I can put it like that, right? Um, and that that's lost. And if, and and warfare hasn't changed, as Jonathan, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman talks about. I mean, the warfare itself has changed, but the effects of it haven't. So what's in common? Trauma, and we're not treating the trauma. People don't want to kill. We're not born wired to kill. Then we're forced to kill, or when we do, or we see killing, that. I would reg say registers in the brain is trauma. If it's untreated, it has a long-term effect. Just look at the statistics that my brothers and sisters have there. <coughs> higher addiction rates, high homelessness rates, longer, harsher prison sentences, um, suicide rates are higher, higher on and on and on. So. Uh, yes, the red hat. Um, thank you. Um, actually, to that point about trauma, um, something that I find really difficult when we're talking about um, any plays that have violence, but especially plays that are about a current sort of military engagement or a current, is that you do run the risk of people in your audience having trauma that is directly related to the work that you're putting on stage. And so I pose the question to any or all of you, um, how you take care of that audience um, and not attack that audience or assault that audience who has already been so assaulted, 
um, while also doing the important work of showing, sort of showing the world what you're showing the world and, and riding that, that kind of fine line. Well, we were just talking about this before we came in, that right. the climate has definitely changed, that um, plays that in the 80s and 90s um, that I wrote and were performed, no trigger warnings were needed, and they're, they're very much appreciated now, and I think they're very important, as you say, and I've seen uh, PTSD reactions, um, not in my play, but in one, actually. But so I just think really, uh, the last play I did, we had posted big trigger warnings, and there was a verbal one at the beginning as well, the assistant director. Um, and she was, it was very detailed um, and gave people a moment also to leave and no judgment and gave them that time and space. I think it's very important. Yeah, I, I mean, that's something that I didn't, I, I will say, like I, I, I was very conscious of, of wanting to respect the character um, and maybe less of thinking about an, an audience member who might have gone through that and as far as from a from a trauma standpoint and and um, yeah and there was one I can't remember where I came across it it was somebody's comment on on one of the productions of the play someone who had been in the military who, who had kind of said oh I went to this play not really <coughs> thinking it, it was going to affect me the way it did but like I kind of thought it was I think he said some just gonna be some kind of bullshit. Play, um, <laughs> um, but then about halfway through, I noticed my palms started sweating, and, and I, and and he ultimately is like, I got through it fine, and it's great, and people should see it, but you know, just so you know, um, and that wasn't directed to me; it was just kind of just sharing it more. Um, so, so that was interesting, and it made me think more. I mean, yeah, beyond. I mean, I think I kind of feel like. I mean, if you're coming to a play like that, hopefully you know that it might, like the subject matter is going to be about what the subject matter, you know, is. But, but I, I think, as you say, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a problem with. I know some people have a problem with trigger warnings. I, 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 I don't know. I think you're safer just getting it out there. And, That's hurt. Uh, exactly. I mean, our, trigger uh, warning. Yeah, it's not costing anybody anything to put that yeah. sign out there. So. I'm, I'm, I'm like itching the heart. Yeah, yeah. I, I love them. I absolutely love them. They infuriated me when I, I mean, it, I, I'm sorry. I meant the what, it infuriated me when I went to a play and they didn't warn me there was a, a weapon being discharged, especially if I didn't see him pointing it and shooting it, and you lost me. Any theater maker had, and I get it. It was I felt like, oh, okay, it's not being made for me. To me, I quite literally um, associate it with when in Shakespeare plays they make an Elizabethan joke and everyone laughs. And I feel like an asshole because I don't get it. I'm like, what? Was that funny? I don't, am I stupid? Um, but so they're the same thing. Anything that takes me so far out that I no longer feel a part of it. So the way I take, the way we take care of an audience is we check with them in real time. That's why Cry Havoc, I have the house lights up at least part way. Um, the Cry Havoc's my solo show. So I can literally watch as they're going. Two nights ago in Vermont, as you described, we had a young lady just... She, she was now the focus. She was having a severe emotional re reaction, or what the Greeks called a, 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 a catharsis. Yes, we, we were at Norwich. We were at Norwich University. A military we were at academy. A military oh. academy. Oh. And she was in uniform, and he was on stage, and he could see her, and he could hear her. Everyone could hear. Start her. to cry. So and why ignore it? So I left down and make it, it. I don't. I say make it part of the show. I don't mean like suddenly like oh it's part of the. I mean. It, we, it's happening. Let's, if we ignore it, it's a lie. The truth is this is happening in real time, so we acknowledge it, we work, take her through it, Dawn comes, sits by her, whatever. We, we now have gotten to a place where we, we have parts, things in uh, ready to put in action, where we were making it up early on. So how do we take care of the audiences in real time, watch them, and, 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 and make it part of the event? Because again, make no mistake, what we're going for is theater, as medicine for our work. And, so it's, yeah. and, the, and the talk back afterwards is absolutely a part of that, so that they're not ripped open yeah. or triggered yeah. and they yeah. get stuck and then... It, ha it happens up. a fair amount. The Vietnam veterans in particular really, yeah. really have really quite strong emotions yeah. to the play because they've never had an opportunity to let this okay. stuff out. It's and been it's decades, and the final thing I want to say is on that, just my personal plug, I, I, I want to say publicly, I'm glad I finally had a form to do it. <laughs> um, with, the, with the trigger warnings, 
I, I would love to think of put, throw this out there for the for the for the debate about that. You, you, I don't know that you'll lose anyone by putting it out there. You might lose their interest or get them upset at the beginning, but you might actually gain audience members you wouldn't have gotten before. Um, because in our plays, in every one of them, when we had M Real M16, this goes all the way back to when I was working on Moving Out with Twyla Tharp before these two wars began, um, the, we had real rifles on stage. And I was warning the dancers, and it was all the men at that time, do not point it directly at the audience. You never know who's going to be in the audience. And it was, it was lost on the group initially, so that's why that. And, and the other thing is to bring whatever group you're representing into that room, not for a day, for the entire process. If you're working with, about veterans, if you're working about violence against African American men, whatever it is, bring people who've been through that in the creative process from the beginning. That would be my personal agenda, opinion alert. <laughs> we also had uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, also, yeah. and counselors, actually. Yeah, we used to have therapists readily really available. We all struggle with the difference between when we, something we see as a reveal, mm -hmm. other people see as an endorsement, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's a really critical difference yeah. Yeah. and, and really. difficult line to walk. Really. Uh, Noah? You know, in the beginning you were all talking a little bit, I think, about different images that kind of um, affected you, or, um, uh, that you had an like, emotional response to. Uh, you and Thompson were talking about the Linda Hickman uh, images of her very powerful. Um, I'm sure talking about the, uh, the, uh, the image of the, the woman who's pregnant, mm -hmm. which is a very powerful and important image in the, in the play. I was wondering how you think about how um, civilians, like elaborate more on how civilians understand and think about war and how you think about that when you um, approach the topic. That's something that some of us in our class have been having to think more about as we, we read all these work plays and um, we think about what we knew before, what we were thinking. Mm. In relating to the image, uh, in images or in general, or, or images of war, or in general, or yeah. I mean, there are a lot of famous, especially from Vietnam, and with the tank, um, uh, the U.S. tank in um, Iraq, on top of the staff. But how do those images change the civilian opinion? You mean? Well, well, how how civilians understand how civilians understand the war was through images or how was uh, it, uh, sorry, it's a strange question. But it seems more like to do with like films and some talk. Yeah, I think because two of us are civilians, have always been. We, we explore it with the audience. Mm -hmm. We take the audience on the journey that we went on, and we just take the, the years to go deeply in, uh, into, into the complexity. But with you, it's quite different because mm -hmm. you come from it. So. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm do, um, yeah, I love that though. That, that the way you just described it, that, that that you're going through it. So take them on the journey that you had. Um, I also can't get out of my head the way you said. So that when people tell their story, that's going back. Sorry, but that was so brilliant about it. the structure is perfect when they tell it. That's I just that's um, stuck with me. That was beautiful. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, I don't know how to answer the question. I. I mean, for my one show, I know that um, as we have people tell it, because we do, we're trying to get uh, veterans to embody their experience, and so then when they have a new story they tell, usually, for my case, it was when Marcus, my, my buddy, was shot in the head. I grabbed his head, even though the air was filled with his cerebral spinal fluid, I grabbed him and then laid him down. And as I did that, everything else was gone. Even, even like I said, that, that, you know, that stuff was, it was in my eyes, and I smelled it for weeks after, and, um, um, but then when I laid him down, whenever I told the story, I did that. Um, brilliant director, like my wife and the, and the guy who directed this play and, and some other folks, pointed that out to me. So we do that with the veterans. We try, anyways, for, start with stillness and then work to a place of gesture, I guess, if I can put it that way, the gesture that they associate with their image. And then the audience will fill in the blanks. We don't have, to let, we don't have, to have them detail it out. If, they do, if I do the gesture once with the story, you fill it in and we let the audience take the leap. So we let civilians fill in as many blanks as possible. I hate, that's what I meant about dumbing it down, like, um, like Black Hawk Down. I'm sorry, I'm making a face on it. Um, there's so much good about it, but I know the, a lot of the men and women that were there, or I knew a bunch of men and women that were there. And uh, uh, 
you know, I, I just hate when they bring in the person who doesn't know anything and like, what are NVGs? Well, they're night vision goggles. <laughs> Everyone in the army knows what the fucking NVG is, right? So we don't, you don't, I don't need that. Trust the civilian. Trust them more. Trust them in that they can make, fill in the blanks, even if they don't know what it is. They're not going to lose the whole play over what NVGs are. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'll say two. Oh, just said that I have a little more time to think about it. That that um. Yeah, that, that and kind of an interesting thing is, is is we might be starting from an image, but then the play. I guess these are all solo plays for whatever reason, and um, and so in some ways we're describing that image. You know, instead of just showing it, which we certainly could have a projection of that picture of the the pregnant woman. But then that's the show, <laughs> right? Uh, and you see it later. But uh, but uh, but instead we're translating it into something, and then kind of as you're saying, sticking it into the head yeah. of the audience in a different way. Yeah. And I don't know how all that works, but Indeed. yeah, the shaft of mm -hmm. what that surface is. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know something that we have one director of Grounded here that, that I that wrestle with, which each production is like, how many projections do you have, or yeah. what do you do, what do you show. Um, and I know, I know for me a, a, a lot of which which uh, Alex did a lovely job of. Well, it's finding that middle ground between um, having them contribute if you're going to use projections, and and maybe you're not at all. Um, but but having that contribute rather than dominate, because again, just showing the image. Um, I mean, I, I think particularly for a solo show, at least for me, I, like I want that narrator to be who we trust. Um, and uh, if you start to see an image that doesn't line up exactly with what she's describing, then we start to wonder who the who is the reliable narrator here. Um, and sometimes you want that, but um, in this case, I wanted it to be the person talking. The, the, like one quick thing, uh, just to add, sorry, but that's where the Native American community are really talking because. Um, the note that they got from the very beginning, I just watched most of the time, and I got to play the evil white guy, which I was happily happy to do. Um, but so much of their their narrative, uh, their, their storytelling, even on stage, was that storytelling. And the note they always got from my ilk, from the European descent or so-called Western theater, was show, don't tell. But their whole storytelling, their whole style, is storytelling, and, and the the. The joke became the way they start, start is long time ago. So now you know who the narrator is. As soon as whoever speaks that, that's our go-to person. So I had thought of that when you mentioned about who's our narrator and how do we trust them in their community. It's whoever says long time ago. Even if others come in, it's it's a story for the the, the audience to fill in the, the blanks. So, mm -hmm. uh, Helena. Um, I just want to go back to the earlier stage of this magical course that I wish I'd taken. Um, to talk about the mediating role that Shakespeare has played for you in these performances and what you think makes it really work for people. And in, in the case of your lecture in Serbia, what made you go back to that play as a way of mediating these issues for yourself? Sure. Uh, doesn't matter. Why don't you go ahead? Well, I was haunted by Srebrenica. And uh, Focha, the rape camps, and, and I, you know, the, it's extraordinary what's on YouTube and terrifying that you see the men, young men and boys, piled onto trucks. You actually see, you can see it all. And uh, uh, Electra, it just to 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 place it there worked and made it contemporary. And. Uh, I mean, Sophocles wouldn't put, wouldn't have Electra actually killing Clytemnestra, but that's really what it was about. So I did have that, but but it, also the whole point. It's not because Clytemnestra, um, had a lot, it's because of uh, Iphigenia was what why Clytemnestra killed um, Agamemnon, had him killed. It's because he sacrificed their daughter, and so I wanted to do it from a feminist perspective as well, placing it there. It's just outrageous that everybody thinks. It's it refers to Clytemnestra as some sort of cougar or something, mm -hmm. to use a vulgar, awful word. But uh, but then placing it in Srebrenica, again, I was haunted, so haunted by that. And I have a very good Croatian friend who was uh, there during the war, actress, mm -hmm. helped me with that. And was in it. She was Clytemnestra. So. Uh, 
Um, uh, the, uh, she, uh, if I remember, I caught up that imagery that I'm trying to remember the question. The Shakespeare? Yeah, yeah the rule of Shakespeare. I mean, you, you started out by talking oh. about how incredibly effective performance yeah. Shakespeare was for you. And yeah. This, this was a catalyst to the whole project, and I wanted it, to know more what yeah. kind of role Shakespeare was playing. Yeah, it's the foundation of, of not only the, the my show, but the, the work that we do that's called Decruit. And, and there's so m many reasons why it works. I mean, it's on every level. Historically, they were in two. Uh, he wrote veterans so perfectly because they were in two wars when Shakespeare's writing some of his greatest works. Um, they were in a uh, nine years guerrilla war with uh, with Ireland. They were in a con on again, off again conventional war with Spain. So Shakespeare was surrounded by veterans and the same people we know from uh, James Shapiro right here in Columbia that that the same people were fighting in Shakespeare's day as today. The, the working class was who, who was doing the bleeding and the, and the causing the bleeding and the dying and the, and the killing. Um, the other thing is that he, um, that the tenets of theater, right, the, the mindfulness that we practice before we, before we speak or enter the stage is, we understand, is, this, is, is the foundation of any uh, individual mental health that we're trying to improve upon, which is, is checking with myself, raising my self-awareness. Shakespeare, to speak Shakespeare, we have to do that because we have to breathe in before each new line of verse, or at least the way we do it. And by doing that before each new line, which, by the way, he wrote in our natural human heartbeat and breath heart rhythm, um, he's forcing us to stay in what the scientists call uh, coherence, um, where or, or um, uh, yeah, I'll stick on that because <laughs> there's like 20 different directions I want to go when I'm trying to be <laughs> concise with my time. Um, but by breathing in before each new line and speaking it in that rhythm which we already speak, it's allowing people to share uh, deep personal secrets, deep personal truths while keeping present in the time rather than going back to their, their <coughs> past trauma. They're also able to share this experience and stay in self-regulation is the other term. Coherence and self-regulation is what we're looking for. Meaning, <coughs> meaning we're not going back into the limbic system, the trauma brain. We're actually staying in the somatic sensory areas of the brain, staying present in this space. We're keeping the singulate gyrus, which is responsible for our time, online, just by speaking Shakespeare. Because I'll give Hamlet to the vets, um, and he, we were talking about this earlier, give it to a professional actor, and right, I'll have to prepare and do all of the things that I need to do to get on my voice, but I give it to a veteran, they have no idea what it means, I'll look at it and say, to be or not to be, that is the question. Yep, I know exactly what that means. I have a personal, like you were talking about, personal connection with that text. But now, Shakespeare provides enough of a distance, it's another character, to where we can provide that mimetic, uh, mimesis, or mimesis rather, um, to where it's me sharing truths, but people are looking at this other character, so it's enough safe distance to where I can step into it if I want, or out of it all the while turning on parts of my brain that normally would go offline, as well as uh, feeling it more emotionally than I ever have before, but my emotions aren't hijacking my actions. My emotions are just information. They're not, they're not in the driver's seat. I'm in the driver's seat because I'm breathing in before each new line of verse. I could go on and on about this, but I... Also, oh, also yeah. to add, there's almost no subtext in Shakespeare. Yeah. Very, very few scenes have subtext. So they just say, you say what you mean. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the strangers, they're coming out. What is that but theater? To come out and have a problem and ask a bunch of strangers, what do I do? Pray, can I not? Right? Claudius says, like a, a man to double business bound, stand and pause where I shall first begin and both neglect that it's perfection. They come out and say, well, help me with my problems. So we give this to a vet and like, wow, that's different. Let me do it again. So. Uh, Jeff? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Stephen, in uh, Cry Havoc, you, you say, uh, you talk about this story where the Marine is with his buddies and he kicks down the door and he's clearing the room and then he sees someone still breathing and shoots him. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about how, um, uh, for him, he's experiencing a different truth from what uh, like a, like civilians are that, that then judged him for that action. Um, and there's kind of this um, this this notion of like the different truth for like the characters in, in your play, Judith, and as well for for you, George. Uh, you know, there's these different truths for the people that are experiencing the things they're going through, um, and um, that idea, that notion of truth, like resonating the most, at least 
in what I find effective in theater, and hopefully most people that enjoy theater as well, um, like what what is the responsibility to like tell this the truth of the story versus like like telling some uh, versus like having some commentary or like talking about like like um, what role like war plays in society. Um, I don't know if that if those ideas connected well in ways. So we have these truths from people that are going through these stories through these things on the ground, but also arguably war is still serving some function on the face of this planet. So if you're if you're telling these stories, which kind of um, you know, show like the atrocities of war. What is like the responsibility to also like make like have some commentary about the function that war uh, serves today or in the past? Yeah. Well, I think it's what, the, the, what as directors, the note we give the actors is don't let the audience do the crying. Don't you cry? <laughs> don't you do the feeling? It's the same with the thinking. The commentary <laughs> is what we hope they'll be talking about in the lobby and on the way home as thinking. Um, sentient people, we have to tell the truths of the characters, and then we hope that provokes discussion, controversy, argument, uh, thought. Yeah, I don't think we have any responsibility to do that. Yeah, and I know one thing that I think, uh, I mean, along with that, I, just trying to get into the head, and, I, and maybe it's, you know, I, I, you know think of, I thought about it a lot because this ground was one of the easier plays I wrote, or at least for the first draft. Um, and I think part of it is just <coughs> getting into that head of that one person and, and just going and, and not allowing uh, personal commentary to a certain extent. It's just like, okay, what does she want and what does she want to do and, and, and what's motivating her right now and not layering on... Um, uh, at least trying to press down as much as I could my own personal because there's times I don't like her you know I mean there's times yeah. she does things that um, I don't like um, uh, and there's times I admire her and there's times yeah I mean I'm, I don't know I'm all the horse in place with her um, but uh, but but that was important to me with this play in particular was just just staying in her head as much as possible and um, and some people, yeah, there's definitely been reviews which is like, well, this is not, you know, as much of an anti-war play as we wanted or whatever. I, but, it, but that's not what, as you said, I don't know, that, or, or they wanted a stronger drums or bad sentence or something it, that's not in there. And, and, and um, uh, so, yeah, so I don't know. I, yeah, I think particularly when you, with plays that are as intimate as, as a one person play, it's really, can't betray that trust of, of that you're that you're listening to a, to a real person with their own thoughts that are not necessarily the authors. It would be so false to have Lindy say, but maybe it really wasn't nice when I read it. Right. It would just be so false. It, yeah, it becomes Parker Posey at the end of Waiting for Guffman, right? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe I will tell him. In hell, <laughs> she's portraying these two characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's portraying both sides. Uh, I think I just yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, I, I triple that emotion in that in that I don't know that when it comes to that, especially truth. I mean, look at the just look at contemporary news, right? Giuliani came out and said, "No, truth isn't truth." And when they were in fact talking about facts, we're, uh, the way I hear you saying it is truth in a theatrical setting when we're storytelling. And it's, it's truth at that point from that person in that moment. Um, my, the way I, when I wrote Cry Havoc trying to answer that question, what the hell is wrong with me, it's now seven years old. I no longer feel the way I did when I wrote that. But I, have to still, I just had to portray it two nights ago. I had to go back and talk about those people as though I felt that way. That's no longer my truth. So you're right. I mean, it wouldn't be, people wouldn't be interested if I went, oh, by the way, I don't feel that way anymore. <laughs> but let me keep telling you the story. You know what I mean? I think you just tell it, and you, you're, I already said it. You already said it perfectly. I mean, because look at Oleana. Um, uh, right? With the Oleana, he puts out enough story to where we're arguing about who's, who's true. Basic psychology is on this. What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I, I agree. I just meant that. I just meant that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Let me pick something different because we're working with psychologists. They show. Uh, they'll show people shooting um, police shooting black men, and it's it's right down the line. It's a third. Not and it's not even according to politics. Sometimes a third, a third, a third. There's a third we see. Justified, a third who think it's not justified, and a third who need more information. 
generally speaking. And then they show a similar thing that has nothing to do with anyone being shot, basic psychology experiment, and those people consistently fall down that line, that I need more information, or it's definitely this, or it's definitely that. So um, I think we're, our job is just to put it out there for you to have your reactions, like you just did about Oliana. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's agency, it's what we want. We don't uh, want to proselytize, we don't want to write something want. To, to provoke real intellectual philosophical agency in our audience because we are all brainwashed constantly and I hope that's the theater that's awakening awakening agency perfect uh, yeah um, maybe you've answered this then uh, but I I'm wondering uh, I mean certainly there's a lot of bridge building that you each talk of doing and um, I'm wondering whether and and among the reasons the bridges, need to be constructed is there's this is as you described there are so the people who fight are a very limited population I wonder whether that is actually among the things you actually want to take on not simply not this sort of jingoistic we should all fight but at the same time you know a sort of community communal kind of if our nation needs war don't we all have to participate and if, if that would be a kind of um, something that you would want to sort of evoke or engage. I wonder if you have thoughts about how one would do something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's definitely been a concern of mine, and I think it is in the play to a certain extent of this idea that, that um, you know, I mean, like right now, <laughs> these wars are going on, you know what I mean? But nobody, I, I don't know, the world continues, or America continues without really uh, paying too much attention to it, and that's something that I, you know, feel guilty of as well. You know, I have, I mean, most of the day I'm not thinking about that. Um, I, so I know, I, I mean, there's one point in the play that, that that doesn't really deal with it directly, but but uh, where the pilot and her husband go to a therapist at his insistence, and um, and she has kind of an inner monologue within the monologue, I guess, about, um, about that and uh, ending with, you know, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to be doing this right now if, if I was actually at war. And she, and, and, and ending with, you know, could, could we all just pretend I'm in a real fucking war? Um, so even she almost is going through this, I guess, disassociation within herself from whether she's actually at, in combat or not. Um, but yeah, but but then so I guess maybe that was an off kilter way of, of getting that in there. Um, but that's definitely something that that uh, that I that I've been concerned with as, as these just keep going on. Uh, Jean, thank you. I thought this was a great panel, and I'm going to ask you about the phrase um, theater as medicine a little bit more because I do think. Stefan, that you have a, a certain way of talking about that in some of what you said about trauma and getting getting through trauma, maybe mm -hmm. not getting over trauma, but really engaging mm -hmm. when you say suppress trauma, mm -hmm. which is a very therapeutic model. Mm -hmm. And the, you two, George and Judith, have talked about theater as provocation, making people think. Is that also within the dissonant model? Are there are these really quite different projects, or are they really a continuous project? <laughs> yeah, okay. well, catharsis, which was the original sort of Aristotelian idea of what theater is, is healing in itself, the, the experience of pity and fear, which is really empathy, I think, as well as being engaged. Um, I think because theater should never, for adults, should never have an answer. It should always end with a question, and I think it should be centered around an impossible question, that agency is therapeutic. Because that's someone being themselves, and knowing who they are, and knowing what they think, and uh, being empowered to think. And empowerment is therapy. Well, yeah, I, I love that. I would say that... Um, I mean, for us, so Decrude is a, is a, is a uh, I'm sorry, the, the name, by the way, because we're recruited but never decruited is where I get the name, uh, the term decrude from. Uh, but we're using it, um, when I say as medicine, we're not, um, we're not making, uh, uh, we're not 
crafting a play and then producing it uh, as medicine. We're taking the tenets that they're using in writing their, the same things that they do to write their plays and then that the actors use to perform it. We're taking tenets, borrowing tenets from those, putting them together with modern therapy techniques and using that quite literally to rewire the brain. So that's why I say theater as medicine. It's not, um, I would say that this is a, these are steps in the processes that, that we use. But, but ours is quite literally get them in the room and start rewiring the brain from the minute we enter the room. Starting to, uh, um, and I love that you said not getting over trauma, but wiring around it, rewiring through it, however you want to put it, but it's not ignoring it. It's, it's, it's um, the, the, it came for me when I was paralyzed in, in high school and I watched, I was put in with stroke patients and I watched them rewire around their strokes, go from half their body per paralyzed to dancing again, to speaking again, to playing guitar, and I thought if they can do that, we can do that around trauma. So that's, that's actually what we are doing, um, if, if that makes sense. So it's much more specifically less about putting a play up. If we do a play, it's for disclosure. Uh, many of the vets use that play to tell their family members or community members things they haven't told them before. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, in some ways it's almost, uh, <laughs> maybe this is not medicine at all, but it's almost a shared trauma. That 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 I think are true of all the plays too. That that um, which I guess ties into ties into the trigger warnings. Whether they should be there or not, I don't know. But but where where by the end of the night, we all in this room have experienced this event, um, and and in this case of all of our plays, with in the most intimate way, with with one person telling us a story. Um, and and hopefully there is some catharsis in that, um, just that, that sharing of that with with another person, um, who hopefully we have a deep connection with by the end of the evening, um, and, and hopefully there's some healing in that, but not not in a you know a specific way of you know of of um, I don't know, just formulating the thought, but but I but I. But I do think there there is something to that. In that moment, you know, before people stop start applauding, you know, sometimes where it's just kind of quiet for a moment, as everybody's like, okay, yeah. what was that? <laughs> and now, okay, we're ready to start clapping. Um, and I love what you said about the, you know that idea that we keep uh, that instead of talking about it and then drive it home, that we talk about it in the space. Right. I love that the, the idea of that um, that. Um, that kind of ties into that, that kind of like, well, let's, let's deal with what we just saw yeah. <laughs> now instead of, you know, letting it yeah. linger. And I think, it, I, I think it, it's all medicine, by the way. I don't mean like the ours is and the, yeah, it, yeah. what you said about agency is exactly right. Look, Shakespeare's Richard III gave me agency, made me go, holy, it put that mirror up and went, wow, there's something wrong with me because I agree with that guy, <laughs> the one that kills all the kids. I feel like him. You know what I mean? And so that, uh, yeah, it's absolutely, I think it's all medicine. It's just a matter of, you know, what what each one treats and who it helps in what way. But it's all. It's, Yvette, Yvette yeah. Nolan's book is actually called Medicine Show. Yeah. Which is a huge mentor of his. And then Jonathan Shea, right here on the university, says, trauma can't be healed until it's communalized. What is theater <laughs> but that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a long game, too. It's not going to happen immediately. Right. No. right. <laughs> we want it to. Uh, Hafsa? Um, I had a question for Judith. You mentioned being um, basically challenged to write a political play. Um, what was the most important thing that you learned from that process, and what would you, what advice would you have for someone in turn writing a political play for the first time? Then take what's, what haunts you, and don't be afraid, because I think I was afraid, you know, who, how would I, have, you know, what do I know? And is it possible? That it, it's, it's a combination of research, empathy, and magic, I guess, magic of channeling that one has to trust. And if it doesn't work, people will tell you. Um, and you just keep going at it. If it really is consuming you and haunting you, and it feels out there, just leap to it. I would say dive in, um, because it's speaking to you somehow. Thank you. Mm. Laura? So listening, having read your 
place and listening to you, the conversation feels to me it's directed towards a audience, not who are the people at war now. So I'm interested to know how each of you would feel as if your play were produced right now in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and what you would anticipate those people who have, let's all agree, more first-hand knowledge of the day-to-day -day impacts of war. What's your fantasy for them? Or perhaps they've been produced, and I just don't know that, so please fill that in. That's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a question of whether we write with an audience yes. in mind, a that particular mean, audience, yeah. the one that we have usually had, right. most of whom yeah. have, have not been to war. Some, some older, much older audience members, sure. World War II, I mean, back yeah. 10, 20 years ago. Right. I, I wouldn't think it, this play would be right in the theater of war. I think it would be too much. Uh, it just wouldn't be appropriate when people are going through what they're going through. I think it's for after, or for people who have not been in the, what they call the theater of war. Yeah, I do. It would be too much. George, I'd be very interested in your response. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I feel yours is, can be pushed to many different locations with different audiences. Mm -hmm. And given the internet, they have some sense of what a drone means, I think. So it's not such a foreign idea. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know for me, I've you know, been lucky enough to see it. And I mean, the play debuted in, in Edinburgh, which, which, you know, right off the bat, I was like, OK, this is a very American play, <laughs> you know. and. And drones, you know, at that point, it seemed to me at least like a very American subject. And I was like, is this a big mistake? Like, what am I doing? Why did I say yes to this? And, um, and kind of had a panic attack and wanted to change every line that felt too American to be, you know, J.C. Penny and stuff like that. But luckily the director talked me down and said, oh, no, they'll love those kind of things, just like you guys like to hear the British. Um, you know, <laughs> say British -y thing, like, you know, or whatever. I love Jason <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. And then, yeah. So, and then, yeah, it was interesting to, that in that case, you know, it was like, oh, when I was over there, I, you know, was slowly learning that, that how much, you know, I didn't know at the time that, that the British pilots were actually flying side by side with the American drone pilots in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, or that the, the or that Germany was building a lot of the uh, uh, parts, or that Israel was building a lot of the cameras. And so it, I didn't realize quite a, how much of a global topic it was at the time. I was coming at it from a certain angle. Um, uh, so luckily, um, and, and then, yeah, as I've traveled around, every time I kind of think that there's nothing, I, I, I was lucky enough to see it in, in, in China about a year ago. and and. Um, and there was a talk back afterwards, which they were filming, which I was a little nervous about, <laughs> just because I wanted to get out of the country. Um, <laughs> and uh, they don't want to be asked the wrong question. And then the first question was, now, you know, there's a lot of war talk in this, but I'd really love to talk about surveillance. <laughs> and I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> How do I answer this one? Um, but um, so it's been interesting that people have seized on different things. Um, uh, different subject matter, and I know it was it was read at the at the Air Force Academy. Um, I didn't I didn't get to see it unfortunately, um, um, and I would be really curious to know exactly like uh, to, you know that audience hearing the whole play um, performed, um, uh, and they yeah they flew out one of the actresses who'd done it and everything, so they were pretty official about it. And I would have loved to have, I, I heard it went over well, but I bet I would have loved to have been there for that reaction. Um, uh, yeah, so. We are at time, so oh. I said we have to do this conversation to a close. Although I hope that uh, thoughts that it is kindled will continue to uh, grow and to percolate uh, going forward. Uh, so again, thank you to everybody so much for being here, for listening, uh, for sharing your reactions. Um, and thanks again to our panelists. Thank you.